recording. Looks like it's working there, but I have no idea. Oh, that's it wrong. Okay, for Halloween, we are going to oh, push the button. <laughs> God. For Halloween, a reading of my horror story called Once in a Blood Moon. I'm going to give it a shot at doing it live. And we'll see how it works. Once in a blood moon. Saturday, September 26, 2015. The creature is angry with me. It doesn't like it when I let the prey scream. A snarl trembles in my chest and I go for the man's throat sinking my fangs into his flesh. For a heartbeat, the man lets out a strangled screech of agony, but I squeeze my jaws even tighter, crushing the life from him. There's a wet, meaty crunch as my teeth meet in his bones, and it's all over. The creature lets me open my mouth, and I take a deep breath, enjoying the familiar scent of warm blood, although the man's dying breath is sour tainted with the stench of fear and frenzied desperation. I lick the taste of him from my lips, then I throw back my head and stare up at the cold night sky. The moon is bright and clear, and a deep need stirs in my belly, a craving even stronger than the creature's lust for blood. I let its impulses flow through me, and my chest tightens, forcing out a howl, a symphony of sadness and elation, sweet joy and bitter loneliness. And it's good, so good to pour my soul out into the gunmetal moonlit night. I howl again and again. And why not? There's no one out here on the moor to hear me. No one at all. Sunday, September 27, 2015 North York Moors. Marcus Sutcliffe's yawn went on for just a little too long and he knew he needed to take another break from driving. It's not even nine o'clock in the morning here, he reminded himself. But his tired mind refused to accept it. His flight from the States had arrived just after midnight UK time and he'd foolishly decided to start the long drive north right away. Now he was exhausted and the narrow road rolled on ahead through open moorland, with no town or village in sight, nothing but wind-swept heather and bedraggled sheep. He spotted a gravelly area at the side of the road and pulled his rental car onto it, parking as neatly as he could, despite the unfamiliar gear shift. Goddamn piece of crap, goddamn stupid car, he mumbled. He flexed his fingers on the steering wheel and thought what he'd like to do to the idiot at the car rental who dealt out this offence to the automotive industry. Marcus had specifically stated that he must have an automatic transmission. Sure, he'd driven a stick shift before, but that was years ago, and in this goddamn country everything was on the wrong side. He closed his eyes for a moment. It's just the jet lag talking, he told himself. A good night's sleep and he'd be as right as rain. And that was kind of appropriate. He sighed and peered out through the rain-streaked windshield. It hadn't rained for the entire journey from the airport, but it felt like it. And it didn't help that the wipers seemed to have a mind of their own. Might as well get moving again, he muttered. He consulted his sat-nav. It had been okay on the main roads, but out here, where the roads seemed to wind around each other like amorous snakes, it was a different matter. The electronic voice was determined to either drive him to distraction or get him arrested for a traffic violation. He wasn't sure which. He scanned the surrounding countryside for a clue as to his whereabouts. A sign, a landmark, a significant building, anything. 
but there was nothing remotely useful. He cursed under his breath and prodded at a button on the sat-nav. Calculating route, it said, followed by, you have arrived at your destination. The hell I have, Marcus said. He unfastened his seatbelt and climbed out of the car, immediately regretting his decision to leave his good coat packed in his suitcase. The cold rain plastered his hair to his scalp and trickled down the back of his neck, but he lifted his face and let the rain splash his skin for a moment. Then he scraped his hand across his face and took a deep breath of fresh air. I hate to admit it, he thought, but that does feel better. He turned around, but there was little to see here. There was open countryside on his left, and on his right the land fell away in a steep slope, hiding the landscape from view. He shut his car door and crossed the road, then leaned on the dry stone wall and peered down into the misty valley below. "'There you are,' he muttered. Nestled in the valley was a scattered collection of farmhouses, and a little way farther huddled rows of grey stone houses stretched out into the distance. That must be Temple Ashton, the town he'd spent the last hour searching for. The cottage he was renting belonged to a farm on the moor just a few miles outside the town. He shook his head in disbelief, then he climbed back into his car and turned the sat-nav off. I'll do better without that damned thing, he thought. Then he put the car into gear and drove on. By the time Marcus eased the ford through the gateway and into the yard at Great Lee Farm, it had stopped raining and he was starting to enjoy himself. Yes, the roads were narrow, but they were quiet. He'd hardly seen another soul, and those cars that he had met had slowed down to let him pass, their drivers acknowledging him with a small wave. It was all somehow very British. Now here he was at least. Uh, now here he was at last, and the farmhouse didn't disappoint. It was a beautiful building, made from mellow limestone and roofed with rustic slate. Its walls were softened by a Virginia creeper, the leaves already turning red, and there was a cheery glow from several of the windows. "'Will you look at the place?' he murmured. It was like something out of a Jane Austen novel. When the front door opened, he half expected Elizabeth Bennet to walk out wearing a smock dress and carrying a basket of flowers. Instead, a tall, middle-aged woman stepped out and greeted him with a warm smile. Hello, she said as she walked toward him. You must be Mr. Sutcliffe. Marcus brushed his hands down the front of his jacket to straighten it, then extended his hand for a shake. Yes, uh, great to finally be here. It isn't easy to find. The woman took his hand for a brief shake. Sorry, didn't my husband send you directions? He usually deals with all that, but he's away. Don't worry about it. I made it here in one piece, so it's all good. He hesitated. She was watching him politely as if she was expecting him to say something, but he wasn't sure what came next. The woman still hadn't told him her name, but English manners were a mystery to him, and he didn't want to start out on the wrong foot. He took a chance with the, uh, Please, call me Marcus. He must have got it right because she smiled. Nice to meet you, Marcus, she said, and you must call me Elizabeth. Marcus stifled a laugh, turning it into a cough. Sorry, I'm kind of tired. Yes, you've had a long journey. I expect you'd like to get settled in. She tilted her head to one side and gave him a concerned look. Her eyes were hazel, Marcus decided, and her smile was warm. It made her look younger, and there was something about the curl of her lips that reminded him of Kate Winslet. He stood taller and pulled his stomach tight. I'm fine, really. The trip wasn't so bad. He gave her a smile. Isn't that what they say about the difference between us? The British think a hundred miles is a long way, and Americans think a hundred years is a long time. Elizabeth laughed. That's very true. The farmhouse is over four hundred years old, and so is your cottage. Come on, I'll show you around. Marcus let out a low whistle. If only the walls could talk. Yes, she said. She looked down for a moment, and when she looked up, her smile wasn't quite so bright. Wouldn't that be something? Sunday afternoon, Temple Ashton. Sorry, it's going to...
Sunday afternoon, Temple Ashton. Excuse me, is that decaf? Robbed wiped the nozzle of the milk steamer, then turned and stared across the counter. The customer was probably the same age as him, but this guy was a joke. From his elaborately styled hair to his carefully trimmed beard, the guy screamed hipster. You're trying too hard, mate, Rob thought, and he had the urge to punch the guy in the face and break his horn-rimmed spectacles. Hell, they probably didn't have real lenses in them anyway. They were just a fashion accessory part of the image. I asked for decaf, the man insisted, but it looks like you've just given me the ordinary stuff. Rob shrugged. Yeah, well, I've made it now. The customer's jaw actually dropped. He stood there gaping, his mouth hanging open like a particularly stupid goldfish. Rob smiled. But of course, I shall make you a fresh cup at once. He turned away before the customer could say anything and busied himself making the coffee. He hummed loudly and tunelessly. That was a good one. It irritated the hell out of people, but they were all too polite to ask him to stop. He turned around and presented the coffee. One decaffeinated soy latte, extra shot, no foam. Thanks, the customer said, though without much enthusiasm. Rob rubbed his hands together. The guy was clearly seething with resentment. Job done. Excuse me, Rob, could I have a word with you a minute? Shit. Rob turned around slowly. Sandra, his supervisor, was standing at the far end of the counter, her arms folded tightly across her chest. Sure, he said, and sauntered over to her. She hadn't just seen all that, had she? She fixed him with a look. What the hell is the matter with you, Rob? she said, keeping her voice low. Rob shrugged. I don't, he began, but she wasn't in the mood to listen. Your mind's not on your job and you look a disgrace. Your hair's a mess, you need a shave, and you've got bags under your eyes. He pursed his lips and nodded thoughtfully. Yeah, I didn't get much sleep last night. A lot of things, you know, on my mind and everything. A lot of tequila, you mean. A lot of Jack Daniels. Rob held up his hands in front of him, the palms facing outward. No, no, I was doing college work until late. I'm retaking my exams, trying to get into university. Sandra did not look convinced. Listen. Take a break for ten minutes, get a bit of fresh air, then pop into the bathroom and smarten yourself up a bit. Splash some water on your face or something, and flatten your hair down. Sure, cool, no problem. And tomorrow, Sandra said, you come in clean-shaven or not at all. Rob ran his hand over his chin. The stubble was pretty thick, but he'd thought he could get away with it. He thought it looked stylish. Also, he'd overslept and hadn't had time to shave. He pulled out his phone and checked the time. I'll be back in ten minutes, yeah? Sandra nodded, then walked away. Stupid cow, Rob murmured as he took off his apron. Maybe he wouldn't come back. Maybe he'd tell them where they could shove their job. On the way out from behind the counter, he picked up the unwanted coffee he'd made. He may as well drink the damn thing. Outside it was raining, a fine drizzle, so he didn't go far. He just took a few steps away from the coffee shop window that leaned his back against the wall. The street was quiet, although a few people hurried by, their heads bent against the rain. He watched a tall woman for a while as she strode confidently along the street. There was something about her. She gave off an air of superiority, of strength. Rob found himself wondering what she looked like close up. Perhaps she worked in the town. But as he watched, a man standing quietly by the wall reached out to offer the woman a magazine. He was a homeless guy selling copies of The Big Issue to earn a few pounds. Rob always bought a copy when he could afford it. But this woman turned on the poor man. Get out of my way, she snapped and marched away. Rob couldn't believe his ears. What a bitch! He looked down at the coffee in his hand and he crossed the road and walked up to the magazine seller. Excuse me, mate, do you fancy a coffee? The man looked at Rob and frowned. It's all right, I haven't touched it, Rob said. He pointed to the coffee shop. I work in there. I made it by accident. If you don't have it, I'll have to throw it out. He held the cup out. Oh, right, the man said. Sure, thanks. He took the cup and cradled it in both hands, then sipped it eagerly. Jesus Christ, Rob thought. He's younger than me. He watched him drink the coffee. The guy had a hungry look, sharp, hawk-like features, intense dark eyes, a thousand-yard stare. 
Perhaps that was the expression you ended up with when all you ever saw was people hurrying away from you, when all you ever got was harsh words. Listen, I've got to go back to... Uh, I've got to go. Sure, the man said. Thanks. He looked at Rob, searching his face. He opened his mouth to speak, then hesitated as if he was searching for the right words. My name's Darren, he said. Rob nodded awkwardly. OK, Darren, see you later. Mind how you go. Darren smiled, but Rob turned away and walked back to the coffee shop. He took a deep breath of fresh air. He'd had a nagging headache all morning, but now it was finally fading. Maybe I did overdo it last night, he thought. The story he told Sandra was partly true. He had done a little studying. But then the urge had taken hold of him and he'd had no choice but to go along with it. Rob frowned. He could never tell anyone about his nighttime jaunts. They wouldn't understand. It was a shame. Maybe if he had someone to share the secret with, it wouldn't seem so bad. Who am I kidding, he thought. What he did was wrong and no one would say any different. But it was so unfair. It was like an addiction. He couldn't help himself. It was just something he had to do. I'll go out again tonight, he thought. I know I will. And across the road, Darren watched him walking away. Watched him very carefully, indeed. Sunday evening. It's going to happen again tonight. I know it is. The sky is so clear and they say the moon will be especially big tonight. A blood moon. A super moon. And there's nothing I can do. In the early days I tried taking sleeping pills. I tried drowning my sorrows in vodka until I fell asleep lying face down on the ground. I tried tying my feet together. I even bowed my head and prayed to the twisted God that made me this way. But nothing ever helped. Nothing ever prevented the creature from creeping into my soul. I've spent the last hour pacing back and forth, checking the sky every five minutes. I've wrung my hands, I've cursed, I've covered my face with my hands and wept, sobbing until my tears ran dry. But the pain remains within me, like cancer growing stronger with every fleeting minute. A bitter taste rises to the back of my throat and I swallow it down. I run my hand over my face and it comes away damp with sweat when my skin is cold. For a moment I taste the creature's foul breath in my mouth and a wave of nausea washes over me. No, I whisper, I can't do it. But the creature is already here. I hear it whispering in the back of my mind. I choke back a sob then start getting ready. I have to work quickly before it's too late. First I lay out the old blanket, then I put the threadbare towel on top of it. I add a tattered cotton rag, then I check my stock of extra strength painkillers, making sure I leave the packet open. It's a sad collection, but this is my life. This is what I've become. And I have no choice. It's going to happen. Any minute now. Marcus lay down on the bed and pulled the cotton sheets up to his chin. The bed felt a little damp, despite the fact that the cottage's radiators were almost too hot to touch. It must be the stone walls. They were two feet thick. The window sills were so wide you could sit on them. And some of the windows had seats built in, complete with embroidered cushions. Yes, this cottage was quite some place. It was bigger than most people's houses. He turned out the light and closed his eyes. If Marcy could see me now, he thought. He sighed. Marcy would have loved this place, but she'd wanted out of their marriage and he'd let her go. What choice did he have? Even so, the divorce had left him bruised. This trip was his present to himself. He'd always wanted to go to Europe and England especially. He had things he wanted to do here. Lots of places to see, lots of sites to visit. It was a pilgrimage of a kind. He let his mind drift. That usually worked, but not tonight. Goddamn jet lag, he murmured. But it wasn't just that. It was too quiet here, almost completely silent. There was no distant drone of traffic, no noises from neighbours. The cottage was separated from the farmhouse by a wide yard, 
and although there were other holiday cottages arranged around the yard, Elizabeth had told him they were all empty at the moment. Elizabeth. She would be at home right now, perhaps curled up with a good book by an open fire, a log roaring in the grate. For God's sake, don't even think about it, he told himself. The woman was married and he had enough complications in his life, didn't he? He turned on the light and sat up in bed. What he needed was a belt of something, scotch. He'd bought a bottle from the duty-free store at the airport. He left it down in the kitchen table. He'd left it down on the kitchen table. Marcus swung his legs out of bed. The floor was cold and the rough tar... Marcus swung his legs out of bed. The floor was cold and the rough carpet tickled the soles of his feet. He walked slowly across the room to the door. He hesitated on the landing at the top of the stairs. The stairway was steep and long and the treads were too narrow for his feet. On the way up to bed he'd stumbled and cracked his shin on the edge of a step. Now he saw that the dim glow from the landing did not reach the bottom of the stairs and with his brain buzzing and his body exhausted Marcus wasn't sure he fancied his chances of making it to the bottom in one piece. Come on old boy, he muttered in his best English accent. Chin up! He started down the stairs. This place explains a lot about the Brits, he thought to himself. Everything is so goddamn character building. Marcus padded through to the kitchen and found a suitable tumbler in the third cupboard he tried. The cap on the bottle of Glenmorangi made a wonderful crinkling sound as he cracked the seal, and as always, the first sip was the best. That hits the spot, Marcus murmured. He took another sip and felt the tension in his neck slipping away. He rolled his shoulders. He felt so much better, but he didn't feel sleepy. Quite the reverse. Might as well do something useful, he said. He took his whiskey through to the front room. Oh. <laughs> he took his whiskey through to the front room, turning on... It's a typo. He took his whiskey through to the front room, turning on lights as he went. He'd laid his laptop out on the coffee table, thinking he'd use it in the morning to do some background research before he set out to explore the local area, but he may as well get started now. He sat down heavily on the overstuffed couch and lifted the lid of his MacBook Pro. Thankfully the cottage came with decent Wi-Fi and he checked the connection as soon as Elizabeth had left him to unpack. He took another sip as the Mac booted up, then he wasted no time in digging into his favourite genealogy sites. His eyes lit up as he scanned through his profiles and updates, and the minutes slipped away. That was why he was here. This was why he'd spent all those hours cooped up in a plane eating rubbery chicken and downing stale coffee. This was why he'd battled with the sat-nav and the rain and the tortuous English roads. He was here. His ancestors had lived and strived in and around Temple Ashton for decades. In fact, if it hadn't been for the Second World War, Mike had... oh. In fact, if it hadn't been for the Second World War, Marcus might never have been born. But his granddaddy had been stationed at an airport. Oh, for goodness sake. <clears throat> his ancestors had lived and strived in and around Temple Ashton for decades. In fact, if it hadn't been for the Second World War, Marcus might never have been born. But his granddaddy had been stationed at an airbase only ten miles from the town. He'd met Grandma at a dance in Temple Ashton's town hall. Marcus took a break from the screen and swilled his whiskey around the tumbler, watching the golden liquid catch the light from his laptop. How different his life might have been if his grandparents had decided to settle here. Perhaps now he'd be living in a place like this, steeped in history, and he'd never have met Marcy. He'd never have thrown so much of his life into a doomed relationship. Don't kid yourself, he muttered darkly. There were surely high-maintenance women like Marcy in every part of the world, and he'd always been a sucker for their fatal attractions. God knows why, he thought, and he downed the last of his whisky. He put the empty glass on the table and stared at it, 
Why hadn't he taken up with a nice woman like Elizabeth? She seemed sturdy, sensible, down to earth. He pushed the thought away and stood up, stretching his back. Maybe he should go back to bed and try to sleep again. He closed his laptop and picked up his glass. Then he stood for a moment, listening. Had he heard something outside? He tilted his head to one side, concentrating. The floorboards in the old cottage creaked every so often, but that couldn't explain this noise. It had been more like scrabbling, scraping sound. Mice, perhaps. Or a cat scratching to be let inside. He went over to the window and pushed the heavy drapes aside. The farmyard was cloaked in darkness. Although there was a full moon, its light did little to help. The holiday cottages were arranged around three sides of the yard, all converted from old stone farm buildings, according to Elizabeth, and the fourth side gave on to the main farmhouse. The tall buildings cast deep shadows, and there were no street lights here to lend their sodium orange tint to the night sky. Marcus peered up at the sky and picked out a couple of constellations. There was the Big Dipper, although they called it the Great Bear over here. It was a fine night and Marcus smiled to himself. But at that moment the scrabbling noise echoed across the empty yard and it was louder this time. Closer and too vigorous to be made by a cat. Marcus stood perfectly still, peering into the murky farmyard. What was that? A dark shape shifted and stirred. Something was moving, trying to hide in the shadows. A crash rang out, harsh, metallic. Marcus swallowed hard. Not something, he told himself. Someone. Yes, someone was out there and up to no good. Maybe they were breaking into the farmhouse. And Elizabeth was alone, wasn't she? He stepped back, letting the drape fall and scanned the room for a suitable weapon. But there was nothing, not even a brass poker by the fireplace. He marched to the front door. There was no phone in the cottage and no signal for his cell phone. And even if he could call the police, they'd arrive too late, especially out here in the middle of nowhere. No, he'd have to deal with this himself. After all, most of these were opportunists and cowards. As soon as they knew they'd been spotted, they'd make a run for it. He yanked the front door open and stood in the doorway, his shoulders squared. Hey, you! he yelled out. I see you. I've called the cops. Get the hell off this property! He waited, holding his breath, but there was no response. Go on, he called. Get out of here. And there was that scrabbling noise again. What the hell were they doing out there? Marcus opened his mouth to call out again, but before he could speak, a raucous screech reverberated across the yard. Marcus stepped back, a chill racing across his skin. What creature could make that awful sound? They didn't have dangerous wild animals over here, did they? Keeping his eyes on the yard, Marcus reached behind him, fumbling for the door handle. And as he stared in horror, he sensed a movement in the shadows. There was a growl, and then something was running toward him, its claws clattering against the concrete as it ran. No! Marcus cried. And in that instant, a security light flashed into life, and the yard was bathed in its dazzling glare. Its beams picked out the animal perfectly. It was no bigger than a spaniel, and its head bore a bold white stripe. Jesus Christ, Marcus hissed. He put his hand on his chest and pressed hard against his ribcage. It was a goddamn badger. Nothing more than a harmless badger. Startled by the light, the badger grunted and changed course, veering across the yard and slipping away into the night. Marcus stood on the threshold for a moment, forcing himself to breathe slowly. God damn it, he muttered. Ridiculous. He shook his head in disbelief. What if Elizabeth had heard him hollering like that? He could try and explain, but she'd surely mark him down as a brash and belligerent redneck. He looked over at the farmhouse. Oh, God. A light came on at a downstairs window. He hesitated. He could wait and see if she looked out. He could give her a wave and let her know that everything was all right. But that might complicate things further. A shadowy figure appeared at the farmhouse window 
and on an impulse Marcus stepped back inside and closed the door. He switched off the light and stood in the darkened room, watching the glow of the security light. When it went out, he crossed to the window and carefully peered around the drapes. All the windows in the farmhouse were dark. Thank God for that, Marcus said. Perhaps you would never know it was him who'd yelled, and he could forget the whole sorry incident. Pretend it had never happened. I sure hope so, he thought. He pictured Elizabeth looking askance at him every time they met. Then he pinched the bridge of his nose and shook his head sadly. Hell of a day, he said. Time for bed. His eyes were accustomed to the gloom now, but even so he put his hand on the wall for guidance and felt his way around the room. When he reached the stairs, he made his way up to the bedroom. He was suddenly tired. Very tired indeed. <clears throat> Monday, September 28, 2015 Temple Ashton <clears throat> The moment Rob walked in through the coffee shop door, he knew he was in trouble. Sandra stormed toward him, a face like thunder. What the hell's going on, Rob? He held up his hands in mock surrender. What? I'm not late. I've had a shave. I'm talking about him. She pointed to the corner table by the window. Rob turned and when he saw the problem, his heart sank. The homeless guy from the day before was hunched over the table, his head in his hands, staring listlessly at the wall. Rob searched his memory for the guy's name. David? No, it was Darren, wasn't it? I've asked him to leave, Sandra went on, but he says he's waiting for you. He says he's a friend of yours. No, Rob said, I don't know him. I just gave him a coffee, that's all. Sandra rolled her eyes. I should have known. He'll be turning up every day now, expecting a handout. She shook her head. Get rid of him and don't let him make a fuss. Give him a coffee if you have to, but it's coming out of your wages. Rob nodded unhappily. See to it then. I've got things to do. She turned and marched away, flashing her fake smile at the customers, all sweetness and light. Rob watched her for a moment. Bloody woman. He loved to wipe that smile off her face. And he could do it too, so easily. He ran his hand over his mouth. Rob, I could do some help here. He snapped out of his daydream. Behind the counter, Maddie was trying to attract his attention. She nodded toward the queue of customers. Getting busy, she said. Sure, Rob said. I've just got to do something for Sandra. He walked slowly over to the corner table. Darren looked even worse than the day before. The skin around his eyes was so dark it looked bruised and a jagged scar trailed across his cheek. As Rob approached him, Darren sat up with a start, grabbing hold of the small table and curling his fingers around its edges, gripping it white knuckle tight. But when he recognised Rob, his expression softened. All right, mate, he said, and he smiled, his eyes bright. For God's sake, why does he have to look so needy, Rob thought. It just makes it harder. He didn't return the smile. Yeah, I'm OK, but you're not. What the hell happened to you? Dan reached up to touch his cheek gingerly. A rough night. Don't ask. Fair enough, Rob said. He took a breath. I hate to tell you this, mate, but unless you're going to buy something, you've got to leave. I'm sorry. Darren's face fell. He looked down at the table for a moment. And when he looked back up, the light had gone from his dark eyes, replaced by the haunted stare from the day before. Oh, I just thought, maybe... He shook his head and stood up, swaying slightly on his feet. Come on, Rob said. He nodded toward the door. I'll see you out. Maybe I can slip you a coffee later when my boss isn't around. Darren shook his head. Don't worry, forget it. And he shuffled to the door. Rob held the door open for him and a hard knot of anger twisted tighter in his gut. It wasn't right. All the guy wanted was to come in out the rain for ten minutes and have a hot drink. Meanwhile, the coffee franchise sold millions of overpriced drinks to people who didn't really need them, pocketing the profits while bending over backward to dodge their taxes. He had a good mind to defy his boss and tell the poor guy he could stay after all. But Sandra had a mean streak, and she'd make his life a living hell for months. It wasn't worth the hassle. As they stepped outside, Rob turned to Darren and said, 
I'm sorry about this, mate. I really am. Gave Darren an apologetic smile and patted him gently on the arm. And Darren turned on him, his dark eyes flashing, his mouth twisted in a start snarl. And Darren turned on him, his dark eyes flashing, his mouth twisted in a snarl. Get your fucking hands off me! What? Rob stepped back and came up against the coffee shop window. Darren stepped forward, forcing Rob back against the plate glass. I'm sick of people like you. You think you can palm me off with a free drink and then wash your hands of me? No, Rob protested. It's not like that. Of course it is, Darren sneered. I should have known. You bleeding hearts are all the same. Rob shook his head. It was my boss, she said. But Darren didn't let him finish. Pathetic, he said. He snorted in disgust and started to turn away. But just as Rob drew a shaky breath, Darren turned back and pointed at Rob's face. You're going to regret this, he hissed. I never forget a face. Never. Then he spat on the ground and walked away. Jesus Christ, Rob whispered. He ran his hand over his face and took one last look along the street to make sure Darren was still walking away. Then he went back inside. <clears throat> As Marcus sauntered along the main street in Temple Ashton, he couldn't help but look up despite the drizzle. He felt like grabbing his fellow shoppers by the arm and saying, Can't you see what you're missing? There was so much to see above the modern plate glass storefronts. A Victorian gable, a Georgian window, an ancient and elaborately carved gargoyle. Some of the stone walls were marked with crosses of cast iron, anchor points to prevent the thick walls from bulging. This place felt more like a movie set than a town. But then he found his prize. He stood still and gazed up at the building. Its upper stories were half timbered, a grid of crooked black beams set into the white wall. It must be hundreds of years old, and beneath the impressive frontage was a coffee shop. Perfect. Elizabeth had thoughtfully provided him with sachets of instant coffee in the cottage's kitchen, but his morning coffee had been weak and bitter. He needed a proper brew, and he needed it an hour ago. He rubbed his hands together and made ready to cross the road, hesitating as a <clears throat> he rubbed his hands together and made ready to cross the road hesitating as a delivery truck approached at an alarming speed he wasn't sure if it was just the fact that everyone drove on the wrong side of the road here but the drivers in town seemed like maniacs he stood back to let the truck roll by then check the traffic both ways all was clear and he stepped into the road he could smell the coffee, and it was very good indeed. But what the hell was this? There was some kind of altercation in the coffee shop doorway. It looked like some poor kid getting the bum's rush. Same the whole world over, he thought. And just like back at home, he was not sure how to deal with a situation like this. Marcus put his hand in his pocket and fumbled for the unfamiliar coins. But as he watched, the homeless kid stormed off along the street. Maybe just as well the guy would only have thrown the money on booze. No. Maybe just as well the guy would only have blown the money on booze, Marcus thought, then immediately regretted it. It wasn't like him to be so small-minded. He frowned. He really needed that coffee. He squared his shoulders as he marched forward. The coffee shop employee retreated inside and Marcus repressed the urge to grab him by the shoulder and set him straight about a couple of things. Instead, he joined the people waiting patiently in line and glanced at the display of cakes and pastries. Marcy had never approved of his sweet tooth, but she wasn't here, and he was on holiday after all, goddammit. He decided he'd ask for a croissant and maybe he'd get an extra shot in his coffee while he was at it. Rob watched the tourist settle himself at his table. American, he thought. That was interesting. He listened carefully as Maddie had taken the man's order. American tourists weren't ordinary in Temple Ashton, especially at this time of year. And this man didn't seem like he was on holiday. He'd watched Rob like a hawk as he'd prepared his coffee and scowled as he'd received his order. Rob wiped the counter down, watching the tourist from the corner of his eye. The man was setting up a laptop now, 
Of course, it had to be a MacBook Pro. The sight almost made Rob drool. If he had a machine like that, he'd get lots of college work done. He'd enjoy it too. There'd be no stopping him. But instead, he had to put up with a crappy old PC that worked when it felt like it and spent the rest of the time in an electronic sulk, refusing to respond or crashing completely. Rob checked that Sandra was nowhere in sight, then slipped from behind the counter and went to clear some tables. The table behind the American was cluttered with dirty cups and plates, and Rob stacked them. It gave him an opportunity to spy over the man's shoulder. It looked like the guy was struggling with the coffee shop's Wi-Fi. Rob took a breath and seized his chance. Excuse me, sir, he said. Are you having trouble? The man turned sharply in his seat. What? Are you having trouble with the Wi-Fi? It's just that I saw your computer and, and sometimes people have a problem connecting. There's interference from the shop next door. Oh, I see, the man grumbled. Now that you mention it, it does seem a little cranky. Rob smiled and indicated the keyboard. I can set it up for you. Do you mind? The man sat back with a sigh. Go ahead, he said. This stuff always seems so easy to your generation. Years of practice, Rob said. He leaned over the table and pulled the laptop nearer. In moments, the Wi-Fi connected and the browser sprang to life. The router is dual band, Rob said, but we have separate SSIDs and passwords for each frequency. He lowered his voice. I'm not really meant to do this, but I logged you into the frequency they use in the office. It's much better, less interference. The man nodded thoughtfully. I'll pretend I understand some of that, he said with a smile. Thanks for your help. Rob stood up straight and shrugged. No problem. Here to help, he hesitated. Are you here on holiday? Kind of, the man said. I am looking into my family tree. Interesting, Rob said. Staying locally? The man frowned. It's just that your laptop will remember this network, so if you're in town and you come back in, it should connect straight away. Ah, oh, I see. Yes, I'm staying out of town up at Great Lee Farm. Rob nodded. I think I know it. He glanced over to the counter. Sandra was there now, watching him. Oh. He glanced over to the counter. Sandra was there now, watching him carefully. Well, I'd better get back to work. Good luck with your research. Sure, the man said. Thanks for your help. No problem, Rob said. Then he cleared the neighbouring table and made his way to the kitchen. Great Lee Farm, he thought. Interesting. <clears throat> Monday night. It's cold tonight. The creature likes it. It enjoys the way the sharp air stings my skin and sets my senses tingling. I raise my nose and sniff the air. The night is still and yet it's alive with a hundred tempting scents. The creature picks out the warm milky scent of an infant the heady perfume of a woman, the musky odour of a man. I run my tongue along my teeth. I can almost taste the iron tang of flesh on my tongue, feel the hot blood coursing down my throat. I try to push the hunger from my mind. It turns my stomach just to think of it, but the creature's greed is strong. Its needs are too great, too powerful. And my feeble resistance was worn down long ago. I just want to get all this over with, and then I can rest. But the creature thinks there are too many people here. It tells me the town is too near. It fears discovery. I must head back toward the cold emptiness of the moor, the one place where the creature is free to roam, free to howl its heart out, free to hunt. I turn away from the town. Good. The prey tonight will be sheep or rabbit. I run silently into the night, and for the moment, I am content. Great Lee Farm Rob slipped out of the shed, closing the door gently behind him. The shed hadn't been locked, and it had been crammed with tools. In his gloved hand, he held a sturdy masonry chisel, ten inches of solid steel. He'd have preferred a crowbar, but the chisel was strong. It would be ideal for forcing a window, or if necessary, he could use it to lever open a door. 
he walked quietly around the edge of the farmyard, sticking close to the shadows. When he reached the far end of the yard, he headed around the corner and crept along the narrow pathway that led to the back of the cottages. It was usually better to tackle a house from the back. If someone heard him, it was easier to run into the darkness of the back garden than to risk a dash across the open yard. And the garden backed onto the moor where he could escape into the night with little fear of being followed. He selected a downstairs window. It was probably the kitchen window, although the drapes were closed and he couldn't be sure. It was perfect. The window sash frame was old and the wood soft. He angled the chisel against the wood where the window met the frame and worked the blunt steel blade up and down, scraping the wood away, widening the gap between the window and its frame. Soon he'd made a hole big enough to insert the chisel properly and he slid the blade into the gap. A push and the wood began to give with a loud snap. He hesitated, chewing at the inside of his cheek. Had he made too much noise? No. It was amazing what people would sleep through. He adjusted his grip on the chisel. One more good push and the catch would give way. Then he'd be in. Bloody hell! The kitchen light flashed on and Rob grabbed the chisel and dropped to his knees. He stayed still for a second, breathing hard, his heart hammering against his ribs. Thank God the drapes were closed or he'd have been seen straight away. He turned slowly, scanning the dark, swaying shadows of the back garden. He had only a split second to make his choice of an escape route. The American would come storming around the corner or could be phoning the police. But even if the guy had just come down for a glass of water, the whole job was ruined. Rob moved into a half crouch and edged away from the window, staying close to the wall. The American might open the drapes and peer out at any moment, and Rob didn't want to be spotted running away. He never knew whether someone might be crazy enough to give chase. Rob bit his bottom lip. From what he'd seen, the American was physically impressive, the kind of man who went to the gym. Rob could probably outpace him, but he didn't like the odds. One slip was all it took. If he ran up against a high fence or an impenetrable hedge, it would all be over. Rob took a breath and then he stood up straight and, placing his feet carefully on the path, he headed for the back garden. Marcus punched his pillow for the third time, but it remained stubbornly uncomfortable. He sat up in bed and ran his hands through his hair, massaging his scalp with his fingertips. He switched on the bedside lamp and looked around the room. He thought the jet lag would have been better by now. I shouldn't have had that extra shot of coffee, he muttered. He thought of the bottle of scotch downstairs. No, he'd already had a couple of decent bouts of whiskey and it obviously wasn't doing the trick. He reached out to switch the lamp off again, but he froze with his hand on the switch. Not again, he said. But when he listened, there it was, the sound of an animal scratching against something, its claws scrabbling and scraping. Goddamn badger! The stupid animal must be back, and it sounded like it was doing some damage. Marcus rubbed his bleary eyes with his fists. He should just wait. The security light might come on and frighten the damn thing away, or maybe it would just give up. And there it was again, this time accompanied by the harsh staccato... But there he was again, this time accompanied by the harsh staccato crackle of splintering wood. The hell with this, he grumbled, and he pushed himself out of bed and headed for the stairs. Downstairs he hesitated. The badger had actually looked quite aggressive when it had charged toward him and he suddenly felt vulnerable in his t-shirt and shorts. He made a detour to the kitchen and opened a drawer, searching for some kind of weapon. Should he take a kitchen knife? No, he wasn't trying to kill the stupid animal. He just wanted to frighten it away. He tried another drawer and among the usual kitchen clutter there was a small black plastic flashlight. That was much more useful. And when he tested it, the beam was bright, but he still felt unprepared. Hmm. But he still felt underprepared. He bent down and opened one of the cabinets. A large cast-iron skillet caught his eye. 
He wrapped his fingers around the pan's cold handle and stood up straight, the flashlight in his left hand, the skillet in his right. I must be going out of my mind, he muttered. Then he set his mouth in a grim line and headed for the door. He slipped his bare feet into his shoes without tying the laces, then opened the front door slowly, peering out into the farmyard. He played the beam of his flashlight across the featureless concrete, but there was no sign of the mischievous badger. Marcus tilted his head, listening, but there was no scrabbling noise, no scraping of claws. The damp night air prickled his skin, and for a moment he thought of his warm bed. He certainly wasn't achieving anything standing here with the door wide open. The badger or whatever animal had caused the noise had probably gone by now, frightened by the flashlight. But if he went back to bed and the noise started up again, he'd be furious. It was better to be sure, to make certain the damned animal had gone for good. He held his flashlight at shoulder height and advanced into the yard, moving the flashlight's beam slowly from side to side. His eyes had adjusted to the gloom, and he was starting to enjoy the cool night air. It was crisp and fresh, and it made him feel alive. He breathed deep and exhaled noisily, watching the plume of his steamy breath billow up into the night. But then, as he stepped forward, a burst of brilliant white light flooded across the yard. God damn it! Marcus raised his hand to shield his eyes, but even squinting against the light, he could see nothing. He must have triggered the yard's security light. He turned away from its glare and looked down. Dear God, what must he look like? Here he was, outside, in the middle of the night, only half-dressed and carrying a frying pan, for Christ's sake. He glanced over at the farmhouse, but thankfully its windows were all dark. No doubt Elizabeth was fast asleep in her bed. Please, God, he thought, don't let her look outside. If she caught him like this, he'd never be able to look her in the eye again. Marcus shook his head and turned back toward his cottage. He walked slowly deep in thought. I must be losing it, he thought. What the hell am I even doing over here? He should be back at home, focusing on his career, getting his life back together. He didn't need to fly halfway around the world to put his divorce behind him. It was time to let go of the past, time to move on. He paused at the cottage door and looked up into the night sky. He was ready for bed now, ready to take his mind off the hook and sleep like a baby. Rob kept to the shadows as he crept into the back garden. The lawn was soft underfoot and his footsteps made barely a whisper as he walked slowly across the dew-damp grass. The pale moonlight gave him just enough illumination to see where he was going, and he chose his path carefully. In seconds he was hidden from the houses by a screen of shrubs, and he increased his pace. Rob allowed himself a grin. He was going to be fine. In a few minutes he cut across the moor, then make his way home along the road. Even if the police did arrive and they managed to spot him, they had no grounds to take him in. Of course he'd have to get rid of the chisel before he met the road, or he'd have a hard job explaining it. He may as well do it now. He stopped walking and scanned the garden. There was a darker patch of ground over to his left. It looked like it was freshly dug earth. Perfect. He glanced back over his shoulder. There was no sign of any danger. So he crossed the garden and squatted down on his haunches. Then he pushed the point of the chisel down to the soft, cold earth. He pressed it firmly until it was embedded all the way. Then he smoothed the soil over with his gloved hands. Rob stood and rubbed the sole from his gloves. Then he walked on. But as he approached the garden's edge, he heard something. A soft sound, almost like a sigh. He froze. The sound had come from a clump of trees, a woodland bordering the garden on his right. Could it have been a breeze whispering through the leaves? No, it had been an animal sound. Perhaps a wild animal snuffling through the wood, or it could have been the cattle in a distant field. The sound travelled a long way on a cold night like this. Rob stared into the deep shadows beneath the trees. Whatever had made the sound, it wasn't going to affect him. He looked back toward the cottage, and despite himself, he gasped. 
There was an aura of white light around the dark stone buildings. Someone had evidently tripped the security light in the yard. It looked like someone was coming out to investigate. It was time to go. Rob turned back to the garden when he glanced over toward the woodland. His heart lurched in his chest. A gentle breeze blew on the treetops. The branches shifted and swayed, allowing a stray beam of light from the yard to filter down and penetrate the shadows below. And caught in that light was the unmistakable glow of a pair of eyes. But this was no farm cat, nor could it be any wild animal. The eyes were huge and too high above the ground to be any forest animal. They stared at him, unblinking. Rob stepped backward. His throat tightened and he put his hand on his chest, willing his lungs to fill with air. Jesus Christ! He had to run, but he dare not look away from those pallid, glowing eyes. He took another step back. A low snarl. It split the night and snapped Rob out of his terrified trance. He turned back toward the cottage, thinking only of light and safety. But as he turned, something surged from the gloom beneath the trees, bursting free from its cloak of shadows, erupting into the moonlight garden. Rob sensed the movement from the corner of his eye and a jolt of adrenaline flooded through his veins. He powered forward, arms pumping, chest heaving, the cold air rasping in his dry throat, his blood roaring in his ears. He changed course, veering straight toward the brightly lit yard and the wet grass slid from beneath his feet. For a heartbeat he flew through the air, arms flailing, legs thrashing uselessly beneath him. And then he was on the ground, landing heavily on his front. The impact forced his face into the soft earth. The sickly sweet smet... The impact forced his face into the soft earth, the sickly sweet stench of mouldering leaves saturating his senses. Behind him something was running, closing in on him, its feet thudding against the ground. Rob pressed his hands against the grass and scrambled up on all fours. As he pushed himself up, he realised he'd fallen next to the patch of freshly dug earth. The steel chisel was within his grasp. He could remember the place exactly. He reached out. But as his gloved hands brushed the soil, something barreled into him, slamming his body back against the ground. He twisted and struggled, and somehow he managed to roll over, but he could not escape from the weight pressing him down. Rob panicked, his mind a whirl of bewildering images. A grey muzzle twitching in a savage snarl, vicious fangs flashing impossibly white in the moonlight, cold, heartless eyes staring down at him, glittering with greed, burning with a brutal hunger. And there was nothing he could do to escape. The dog-like beast pushed its muzzle toward Rob's face. He could feel its hot breath on his cheeks, smell the dampness of its fur. He threw up his arms to protect himself, but he was too slow. The beast lunged at his neck, its jaws wide open. Rob screamed as the beast's teeth sliced into the soft skin of his throat, but then its jaws shut tight and suddenly Rob could only gag and gasp for air. With his last reserve of energy, Rob lashed out, beating his fists against the beast's tangled fur. But it had no effect. And then, as Rob's vision blurred and the cold crept into his veins, he realised that the creature was dragging him across the wet grass, taking him toward the woodland. In the distance, Rob could just make out the glow from the farmyard but he could not call out for help. And when the darkness came to claim him, he was powerless to prevent it. Marcus stepped back into the relative warmth of the cottage, but as he closed the door behind him, an unearthly shriek of tortured agony shattered the silence. He froze, the blood draining from his face, and he checked the door was fully closed, leaning his full weight against it. Jesus Christ, he whispered. What was that? 
Could it really have been the cry of a man? Or was it the last desperate yelp of a wounded animal? Marcus chewed the inside of his cheek. Someone could be in real trouble and he couldn't just stand there and ignore it. But what should he do? Elizabeth would have a phone in the farmhouse, but it would take some time to rouse her. And what would he say to her? He heard a noise and got scared. Marcus shook his head. He'd have to go and take a look himself. After all, he had a flashlight. If someone was up to no good, the sight of the flashlight's beam might be enough to send them running. Marcus looked down at the cast-iron skillet in his hand. It was a clumsy weapon, and he'd no intention of engaging in a fight with a criminal, but perhaps it was better than nothing. He took a breath and opened the door once more, stepping out into the night. The yard was still lit by the security light, and clearly empty, so he moved on, glancing nervously from side to side. The first thing to do was to make sure the immediate area was secure. He'd check around the back of the cottage and move on from there. He held the flashlight high and turned the corner, heading for the back garden. It's almost over for tonight, even though I've just begun to feed. I cram the meat into my mouth as quickly as I can, tearing at the carcass with my fangs, but already my limbs are trembling. I'm going to change soon. The creature has almost finished with me, but its pitiless hunger still stirs in my belly, and I want more, more, and I know exactly where I can get it. There was no security light in the back garden and Marcus's small flashlight did little to puncture the darkness. In the daylight he'd found the garden's carefree scattering of shrubs and roses charming. But in the darkness the twisted tangle of branches and thorns felt threatening. As Marcus played the flashlight's beam across the garden, the dark shapes of the shrubs sent sinister shadows sliding across the wet grass. Marcus hesitated. There was nothing to see here. But should he go further into the garden or return to the yard and make sure there was no trouble up at the farmhouse? He turned slowly, listening. There, the sound of someone or some animal rustling through the undergrowth. The sound echoed in the chill night air, but it seemed to come from the far end of the garden. Marcus fought the urge to call out. Better to keep quiet until he knew what he was dealing with. He tightened his grip on the skillet and set off across the grass, placing his feet carefully and keeping to the centre of the garden, avoiding its shadowy perimeter. <clears throat> he tightened his grip on the skillet and set off across the grass, placing his feet carefully and keeping to the centre of the garden, avoiding its shadowy perimeter. He moved slowly, shining the flashlight into every shady space between the shrubs, double-checking every nook and cranny. But the narrow beam found no sign of a disturbance, and he could hear nothing except the gentle whisper of the wind in the treetops. And when he reached the fence at the far end of the garden, Marcus knew he had no choice but to return to the cottage. Waste of time, he muttered. But he'd done his bit and he could never have rested if he hadn't, at least, tried to see what was going on. He heaved a sigh, then started back toward the cottage, still shining his flashlight around the garden, but no longer expecting to see anything. The farmyard was still lit by the security light, but Marcus scarcely spared it a glance as he walked back to the cottage's front door. He hesitated with his hand on the door handle. He didn't remember closing the door properly, but it was tightly shut now. The breeze must have blown it shut, he thought, as he let himself in. Thank God I disengaged the latch. Locking himself out would have been the last straw. Marcus padded along the hall and stopped off in the kitchen to drop the flashlight and the skillet on the table. Then he trudged up the stairs, holding tightly onto the banister as he went. He was feeling a little dizzy and his whole body was heavy with fatigue. Man, I'm going to sleep all right now, he murmured. But as he stood in his bedroom doorway, all thoughts of sleep fled from his mind. The bedroom light was switched off, but the faint glow from the hallway behind him was bright enough to show that someone 
lay beneath his bedclothes. Marcus staggered backward, his heart hammering in his chest. He opened his mouth to yell, but his throat was too tight. He wanted to run for his life, but his legs refused to move. He could only gape in horror as the shape beneath his bedclothes shifted and turned. It's all right, Marcus. It's me. Elizabeth. Marcus put one hand on the wall for support. What? Elizabeth? It's all right, she said. Don't turn the light on. Just come to bed. But I don't understand. I know you want me, she said, and her honeyed voice intoxicated him. I could see it in your eyes. You do want me, don't you, Marcus? I speak softly to him, and he comes to me, walking slowly as if he's in a dream. I've turned off the lamp so he won't see the state of me. He might feel the dried blood on my skin, but I'll make him ignore it. I'll wrap my body around his and he won't care. He won't see or feel anything except his lust, his greed. He wants me and I need his desire, his passion. I need to feel warm again. I need someone to touch me and remind me I'm a woman. I need to feel alive. But more than anything else in the world, I need to feel human just for tonight. And that's the end of Once in a Blood Moon. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you're watching or watching a recording, um, yeah, I was doing a live uh, performance on Facebook. The sound will be cleaned up and sent out. I'm going to send it out to members of the Awkward Squad, which is my readers group. Um, and if you want to get your hands on a uh, on a live reading, of, well, on a and a nice reading of that with the sound cleaned up and all the ums and ahs and the mistakes taken out, then head on over to mikeycampling.com forward slash free books and you can listen to the whole thing at your leisure. So thank you very much and I'll stop there. <laughs>